Well, thank you, Doug, um, for introducing me. And indeed, you have inspired me too. And thank all of you for the wonderful welcome you just gave me. And I think I start off by, I mean, in this conference, we need the voice of animals, right? And so, and now, having done the chimpanzee, would all of you who have a special animal in a zoo, would you reciprocate right now? Come on. There you are. Now we've brought all their voices in because they're the important ones, aren't they? <coughs> this talk will not be quite the polished thing I planned because we're here to talk about zoos. Zoos have changed a great deal since I was a child and every one of you here cares about animals, understands animals and knows the kind of lives that they should live. But this morning, I just went to the Patton Zoo and it shattered me, it shocked me, and it's like going back to the dark ages. And I think there should be another word. I don't think zoos like that should be given the opportunity to call themselves zoos, because they're not, they're prisons. They're animal prisons, and not much different from the animals in tiny cages in medical research labs. So I won't dwell on that. <clears throat> My love of animals was born into me when I was a little child. And I think I learned most about animals and how important they are and what individuals they are and how intelligent they are and how emotional they are. I learned that from my dog, Rusty. And that's when I was growing up and he was my constant companion. And then, as you all know, I was lucky enough to go out to Africa. I had to save up. We didn't have any money. To get the fare, I worked as a waitress. I went to stay with a friend who'd invited me for a holiday, met the late Dr. Louis Leakey, and amazingly, he gave me the opportunity to go and live with not just any animal, but the one most like us, the chimpanzee. And I want at this point to give the chimpanzee credit for one thing. And this, in a way, has some implication for the zoo world. And that is that when I was made to go to Cambridge University to do a PhD, I hadn't been to college. I didn't have a primary degree. But Leakey said there was no time for that. And he got me a place to study ethology in Cambridge University. And when I got there, I found to my horror that many of the professors told me I'd done my whole two-year study wrong. I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. They should have had numbers. I couldn't talk about them having personalities, minds, or emotions, because those were unique to us. Because of Rusty, my dog, I knew that that was wrong. Because the chimpanzees not only behave like us in so many ways, like the other great apes, but biologically. I mean, they are our closest living relative. Our DNA <clears throat> differs from theirs by only just uh, over 1%. And so, it was the chimpanzees who helped science to come out of the little narrow box, which announced that we humans were totally unique. Between us and the rest of the animal kingdom was a sharp line. It was a difference of kind, not of degree. And it was the chimpanzees who helped to break down that barrier and help us to understand that we humans are not, after all, the only beings on this planet with personalities, minds, and emotions. Being in Gombe after I got my PhD, building up a research station, being able to spend hours each day out in the rainforest, learning about the interconnectedness of all living things and how each little species plays its role, even though it may seem insignificant. This thing that we call biodiversity, 
I prefer to call it the tapestry of life because biodiversity is a cold word and to non-scientists it doesn't mean very much. And I thought that my life could never get better. It was better than the life I dreamed of as a child. And then everything changed in 1986. 1986, I went to a conference in the US which brought together all the different people by then studying chimps in six different African countries. And we had a session on conservation, which was shocking, chimp numbers dropping, forests being cut down. And we had a session on conditions in some captive situations, bad zoos, yes, cruel training of circus and other entertainment chimps, yes, but worst of all, chimpanzees in medical research, in five foot by five foot cages, maybe for up to 20 years, our closest living relatives. How could that be? I went to the conference, I had my PhD, I could call myself a scientist. I left as an activist. And since then, October 86, I haven't been more than, uh, more than um, how many, three weeks. I haven't been more than three weeks consecutively in any one place because it seemed so important to go and talk to people about what was going on. <clears throat> the importance of saving environments, the importance of saving species, and the importance of individual animals. We should never forget that. So I'm very happy Doug told me yesterday about this Global Species Congress, which is in its planning stages, which will try to bring conservation of species up to the, uh, into the interest of the UN. But we must never forget, and this is important in zoos, as important as anywhere else, that each animal as an individual matters. So I divided my little talk into various sections to talk about today. My first experience with zoos was when I first got back from Gombe and I returned to the London Zoo. Well, sorry, I should, I should back off there. My first experience with zoos was before I went to Gombe, and I got a job at the zoo to try and learn a bit more about chimps. And the London Zoo perhaps wasn't quite as bad as Patton Zoo, but jolly nearly. And there were two chimps in a tiny cage with a concrete floor, no running water, shut out in the heat in the summer, shut in in the winter, bored, stiff, nothing to do. They didn't even like each other, one male, one female. And chimpanzees, like people, have likes and dislikes. Can you imagine being shut in a little room or even a little house for all those years with somebody you really don't like? And by the way, just an interesting little side, side note, I heard the other day there was a male orangutan and they wanted to find a wife for him and so they started a dating profile and they showed him photographs of female orangutans to see if that would help them uh, decide which one might be the perfect partner for him. I think that's an interesting use of modern technology in animal welfare. But anyhow, <clears throat> next door to these two sad chimps was one lone gorilla guy. He'd been there 20 years alone. Signs of boredom, the male chimp would counting his fingers on and on and on. And Guy, the male gorilla, so bored that he would pee onto the cement floor and then suck up his pee by poking in a straw. And I vowed when I was there that I would try and help them. And when I got back from Gombe, I did. I designed a little box with holes where the chimpanzees could fish using pieces of straw for whatever was in the box. Why wasn't it used? It wasn't used because the keepers couldn't be bothered to clean it. And so when I said earlier that zoos have changed over the course of my life, <clears throat> that's one way in which zoos have really changed. The keepers have changed. It used to be a job. The first keepers I knew in London Zoo, they didn't really care about the animals. They didn't really care which species they looked after. 
It was just a job. They arrived at a certain time, they left at a certain time, and did what they were told to do. You wouldn't find keepers in most zoos today who wouldn't be excited to be given something to alleviate the boredom of the animals they were looking after. And the keepers today care about the animals as individuals. They love them, they know them. They explain some of their behavior to the public. They help in education in that way. And I found this changing all around the world during the years that I've been visiting zoos. I first got really, uh, the Jane Goodall Institute became involved in zoos when at Gombe we had a kidnapping. I used to have students out in the field. They came for three months or six months. They came to do a doctoral degree in some aspects of behavior, or they came as, as um, uh, stu students to help us collect the long-term data, which, by the way, we're still collecting, and we're about to be in our 60th year of research at Gombe into one group of chimpanzees, which is a, a world record. We got into the Guinness Book of Records this year. So, in, I can't remember which year, but uh, my, four of my students were kidnapped, taken over Lake Tanganyika to the uh, to DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and held for ransom. So, although we got them all back safely in the end, it meant we, we absolutely couldn't continue for some time to have students at Gombe. And there were students who were so disappointed because they'd been waiting and working to get to Gombe. It was their dream. And I suddenly realized, and this was in the US, well, there are zoos which have good chimpanzee groups. They've got reasonable space. They have social bonding with each other. And if I can get the zoos to agree for students to go and study these chimpanzees non-invasively and work with the keepers, that's something. And so we started a program that we called Chimpanzoo, which is still going today. Patrick Van Veen is somewhere back here, and uh, he's, he's working on Chimpanzoo in Europe, and we have people working in, in the US as well. And so once this idea came into my mind, then I was visiting all kinds of different zoos. And many of the zoos were very keen to have students come. And we made, uh, we made a, a, a protocol. Students would learn the different gestures and sounds of chimpanzees on video so that they were all collecting the same kind of data on the same kind of data sheets. And the idea worked brilliantly. It helped young people understand more about the chimps, and it also helped with enrichment because they volunteered to, to introduce new kinds of enrichment into the zoos where they worked. And we had a chimpanzee conference once a year, and the young people got together, and they had all their uh, poster boards talking about the different kind of enrichment that they had designed, what was successful and what wasn't. And I was visiting all these different zoos and learning a great deal about what's good and what's bad. And <clears throat> I think the, the various issues that we have to think about is, first of all, if, if you meet a bad zoo, and I'm going to take the Patam Zoo because I was just there. It's terrible. And if you haven't seen a really bad zoo, go and visit. It'll cost you $5, I think. And so, as an NGO, we have a choice. Do we try and introduce... Thanks, it's my voice, it's overused. <laughs> my voice is overused. Anyway, um, so do we, do we try and get the zoo to allow us to bring in volunteers to provide some kind of enrichment for these animals who are bored stiff? They have nothing. They have a cement floor. They have bars. They have something to sit on. They have no bedding. They have nothing to do. And I seldom, well, not for many, many years, have I seen such terrible, terrible conditions. 
Or do we say as an NGO, well, if we try and work to improve conditions, there'll be an awful lot of people saying, well, you shouldn't be working with the zoo at all. We want us to, to disband the zoo, to close it down. Yes, a zoo like that shouldn't exist. But that could take a long time and a lot of legislation. If we start thinking of those animals, not just as animals in a zoo, but as individuals, can you imagine, put yourself in a position where you're shut up in a small space with nothing to do, no books to read, nothing at all. And yes, maybe you're going to get out in five, six years. Is it better to have something to do for those five and six years? I think if you're an animal, the answer is yes. And so these different questions that come up, we answer them in an ethical way by thinking about the individual animal, rather than what will, our, what will our reputation be if we're seen to be working with a really bad zoo. We should put that aside and think about the welfare of the animals. So, There are three groups of people that I encounter as I travel around the world. There are those who just say, animals should not be in zoos, full stop, get rid of them. Not quite sure what they plan to do with them, but get rid of them and as soon as possible. Then there are uh, those people who say, well, let's improve the conditions that are there. And then there's a group that says, yes, let's improve the conditions, but let's move towards another future where zoos are more like sanctuaries. One of the problems that I have encountered in zoos and sanctuaries is that the animals are given no choice. At a certain time of day, you're fed. At a certain time of day, you go to bed. At a certain time in the morning, you're let out. You're let out of a sanctuary and the door is closed until it's time to go to bed. Well, sometimes the chimpanzees will actually tell you that they don't like this. And there was one zoo somewhere in America, and they were all supposed to come in when it got dark, which wasn't a bad idea because it was a bit unsafe at night. But the, this male chimpanzee decided that was not his choice. The door was one of these um, doors that dropped down like that. And so the females obediently went in and he sat in the doorway and held it up and wouldn't move. And he sat there for over half an hour. And then finally he relented and went into bed. So for animals, having a choice is really important. They should be able to choose when they want to feed. They should be able to choose, if possible, when they go in. Whether they want to go out in the snow and the rain or whether they want to stay inside. And I loved one of the zoos in the Netherlands. They had this group of gorillas. And it was very, very cold in the winter. And obviously, you don't want tropical animals going out in the cold. But rather than just say, no, you can't go out, they had um, a, a curtain, a very um, solid curtain. And so what the gorillas could do was to move the curtain put their faces out, put their faces out into this cold, cold day and say, no, I don't want to go out there. But I could. That's the difference. One thing that we've been learning uh, is about animal intelligence. If I was a student today, I mean, I tell students, I don't think there was ever a more exciting time in my lifetime for studying animal behavior. You know, first of all, reluctantly, science decided, yes, all right, chimpanzees and other uh, great apes and then primates, yeah, they, they're much more intelligent than we thought, and yes, they do seem to have emotions. And then this was transferred to elephants and lions and other creatures like that. But then came a whole flurry of interest in the bird brain when scientists discovered that crows, Caledonian crows, can solve problems as well as chimpanzees. And if you look at the crow research today, it's absolutely amazing uh, what crows can do. And then a whole flurry of, of interest in the intelligence of the octopus, which doesn't have a brain anything like ours, and yet they can solve all kinds of puzzles and problems. 
And they've even managed to teach bumblebees how to roll little balls, and if they drop it down a hole, they get a nectar reward. Well, that's kind of surprising. But even more so, other bumblebees who have not been taught can do this test straight away, first time, just from watching the trained bumblebees. So I'm waiting for a time when we stop being amazed when we hear stories like this. We've been so arrogant in thinking that we're so different from the other animals. And when we hear a wonderful story like that, we should be happy and excited, but not amazed. It shouldn't be amazing. But I'm guilty. I heard about the bumblebees, and I was amazed. But if you know about the history and the behavior, the extraordinary behavior of honeybees, then you shouldn't be amazed to think that bees can actually learn simple tasks like that. One of the problems for zoos, of course, is getting the funds. You can't really do major improvements without doing big fundraising drives by having a lot of money. And I've been to so many zoos where they have plans for the future, but they have to do it one at a time. Yes, we know this is terrible enclosure for our gorillas, but we've got to do the elephants first. Elephants shouldn't be in zoos. Personally, I don't think elephants belong in zoos. A sanctuary where they have masses of space, uh, where they've been rescued, yes, but zoos, especially where, where so many are kept on concrete, it's not a good idea. Whales and dolphins shouldn't be in aquariums, but we'll leave that aside. So zoos have to get the funding, and to get the funding, they need the public to come, or they need grants from the government, and different zoos tackle this problem of funding in different ways. Then another um, aspect of, of zoos, which is tremendously important, and I think you mentioned it, Doug, is that so many people I meet who are in science, who are in conservation, they say, well, I, I, I went to the zoo when I was a child, and I looked into the eyes of an elephant or a, or a chimpanzee, and I decided I got to learn more about them. And having learned more about them, decided I want to help save them in the wild. And you don't have to become a conservationist. You don't have to become a scientist. You just have to develop this empathy with animals and want to help to save them. And people going into business and making lots of money can help in huge ways. So all of us can play our part. I think for a small child going to a zoo, you know, people say, well, if you could watch a video, watch Blue Planet, watch one of these amazing nature films, and you don't need to go to a zoo. But if you're a little child, okay, you watch television, and you see a film about the behavior of elephants, and it's wonderful, and you're fascinated. But you know, I'm thinking of a little four-year-old. And the next day, you look at your television screen, and there are animated copies of dinosaurs, What's the difference? There isn't any. They're so realistic, some of these created prehistoric creatures. But when you're actually in the presence of an animal, it's more than just learning about the behavior. It's an empathy that you develop by looking into the eyes, by sensing that there's a being out there. And I, I remember looking one day into the eyes of a chimpanzee at Gombe and knowing there's a thinking, feeling, sentient being looking back at me. And that's what we need to develop in our young people. Through our chimpanzee program, we started off with university students, but then we included high school. And then one man in the US made a wonderful program for, for small children. And so, Roots and Shoots began in 1991 because I was meeting around the world young people who seemed to have lost hope for the future. They were angry or they were, uh, they were depressed or they just didn't care. Most of them just didn't care. And I began asking them on all continents, why do you feel like this? 
And they said, well, you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. We have compromised the future of our young people. There was a saying that we haven't inherited this planet from our parents, we borrowed it from our children. We haven't been borrowing our children's future. We've been stealing it and we're still stealing it. But I think we have a window of time when we can get together and start healing some of the hurts that we've inflicted. So Roots and Shoots is about, with its main message, that each one of us makes a difference every single day and we have a choice as to what kind of difference we're going to make. And the groups, and there's about 150,000 active groups now from kindergarten through university in 80 countries. And they choose three projects to help people, to help animals, to help the environment. And many of them are working with zoos, many of them. And they share their information. And they've come up with some brilliant enrichment ideas, one group of high school students. And so zoos are really helping young people to develop this empathy for animals by sitting and watching and getting the feeling of those other beings out there. Of course there's legislation, legislation for animal welfare rules, which if they were properly developed and properly applied would mean that zoos like Patton, and Patton is certainly not the only zoo like that, they wouldn't be allowed. But that's going to take time and a lot of legal work. And fortunately, there are people working on the legal side of it. And judges are beginning to understand that although an animal can't be a human being, personhood is something that doesn't, if you look up the dictionary, it doesn't mean a human person. And so things are beginning to change from the legal aspect as well. And the sooner the better as far as I'm concerned. So another question, a big question. Should there be zoos? Some people say no. Some people say we should never keep animals in captivity unless they're rescued and they're being rehabilitated or cannot be released back into the wild. And I can understand that. But here's the thing. There's this lovely dream of the wild. Animals need to be in the wild. Wild is a paradise. But sadly, that's not true. I've been in so many parts of Africa and visited chimpanzee research sites and talk to the people who know the chimpanzees they're studying as individuals. And some of them are being caught in wire snares set by hunters, losing hands and feet as a result, or dying of gangrene. Humans, populations growing, moving deeper into the forest, bringing with them their diseases. Chimpanzees, so like us, catch our infectious diseases, but they have built up no resistance and something like measles can wipe out a whole community. And you can go to places and hear the chainsaws, and the chainsaws are getting closer. And we now know enough about animals to know that they can understand fear. They know that something bad is going to happen. And a group of chimps move into a neighboring forest to get away from the tra chainsaws or the cattle invading their forest. There's other chimpanzees living there. Chimpanzees are territorial. The newcomers will be attacked and probably killed because like us, chimpanzees have a violent and brutal side. And you see with a chimpanzee, a territorial chimpanzee community, exactly the same kind of behavior as we are directing towards migrants who are fleeing from equally terrifying aspects of their lives, whether due to climate change or whether war. Not much different from us in all these ways. And so the other day, I'd been visiting various parts of Africa, seeing the little orphans whose mothers had been killed for bushmeat, seeing infants in the marketplaces huddled, tied up with a chain around the neck, and we do, the Jane Goodall Institute has uh, two big sanctuaries in Africa where we look after and try to rehabilitate these 
these orphans of the bushmeat trade. Many of them are fully grown now. And coming back from Africa, I can't remember which zoo I was at, but it was a zoo in America. It had a really big enclosure. It had a very compatible group of individuals who'd been together for years. And it was evening. They weren't driven inside until it got dark and they wanted to come because their supper was waiting for them. That's a way to get them to choose to go inside, have their supper waiting in there. And the two males were grooming each other and one female was grooming one of the males and the other was just sitting, looking very happy as she watched the, the young ones playing together in the evening sun. And I thought, okay, I'm going to put myself in a chimpanzee's position. And if I was a chimpanzee, I'm going to choose that captive group even though they don't have their freedom. Because the wild isn't always meaning free for the chimpanzees and the other animals who live there. And so if you're in a really good group and you have people who care for you and love you actually, and an adoring public, and good food, the right food. Well, is that so terrible? A big problem with zoos is the captive breeding program, which is rooted in science, and as far as that goes, it's good. But sometimes an animal is removed from his or her group because of the captive breeding program, and the group ties are disrupted and the poor individual is sent off to some faraway place and expected to get on with animals that he or she would perhaps never have chosen to get on with. And then there's another thing about the captive breeding. Some animals are deemed useless for the breeding program, and they're killed. Perfectly healthy animals, and I'm sure all of you heard about the giraffe who was killed in the Copenhagen Zoo, and soon after that, four lions, because they were no use for the breeding program. So, today the shelters for dogs and cats. When you take on a dog or a cat, you're asked to give it forever home. You're asked to make sure that this animal that you take into your life is going to be looked after for the rest of its life. And somehow zoos need to do that. Now, I'm not trying to give solutions. I'm simply trying to raise the kind of issues which have to be faced if we want to truly prove ourselves to be ethical human beings, if we want to truly prove that we understand the, the, the needs of these, these different animals that live in zoos. There was one, I think it was a jackal or a fox in the Patton Zoo. It had a cage not much wider than this. And I had to stop looking. It just went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. When I said it was like a prison and it shouldn't have the right to be called a zoo, a prison is mostly anyway for people who have committed crimes. And I kept looking at these animals and I said, I'm sorry, I would rescue you if, if I could. You haven't done anything wrong. Why, why am I here? They seem to be saying. And so the whole zoo issue is really complicated. And I get very upset when people take opposite sides and fight each other because that's not what we should be doing. And I can understand all different points of view, but we need to find ways and sit down and talk about it. And that's why Waza is so important, because it brings you all together. And it means that you can discuss some of these issues with other people who care and feel about zoos the way that you do but also bringing into the conversation what you've heard, because I know many of you here, you know, that zoos are bad and should be closed and, and the animals should be disposed of and things like that. So you have the opportunity of talking among yourselves about these different issues. And I think 
I want to end up with one story. Um, it's a chimpanzee again. It's a story about a chimpanzee whose mother was shot in the wild, and he was sent to America to be part of medical experimentation. So for about um, 14 years, he was in one of these small cages. And then he was lucky that the, the lab didn't want him anymore. And so they gave him to a zoo, Lion Country Safari in Florida. And he was put on a man-made island, because chimpanzees don't swim, with three females. Uh, one was rescued from the lab, and two were from a circus. And they managed to get on all right, in fact, so well, that after a while, a baby was born. This male old man, he was called old man because although he was only two when he arrived, a little baby chimp who's miserable and depressed after losing the mother, they huddle on their faces all wrinkled. They look like little old men. But anyway, a baby was born. And this young man was employed to look after the, these, this group of four chimps, now with a baby. And he was told, don't go anywhere near those chimpanzees. They're vicious, they're much stronger than you. They'll try to kill you. So Mark threw food onto the island from a little paddle boat. And he began to watch them. And he saw how before they even took a bite of food, they hugged each other. And you know, those of you who know chimps, mm, great excitement. And he saw how they had so many gestures and postures like us, kissing, embracing, holding hands. And he saw how old man absolutely loved this baby, his baby. And as soon as the mother allowed it, he would uh, carry the baby around, he would share his food and protect the child from real or imagined danger. Mark felt how can I look after these amazing beings if I don't have some kind of good relationship with them? So he began going closer and closer. And one day, he held out a banana. An old man took it from his hand. He said, Jane, I know just how you felt when David Greybeard took a banana from you. And then one day, he dared step onto the island. And nothing happened. And then he went and sat near old man. An old man allowed him to groom him. And one day, old man turned and groomed Mark. And one day, Mark dared to tickle old man. And <sighs> came chimpanzee laughter. So they became friends. And everything was fine until one day, Mark's clearing up on the island. And it's been raining. And he slips. It's muddy. It falls flat on his face. Unfortunately, the infant, who's now about one and a half, happened to be nearby, screamed, got frightened. And the mother, thinking, I suppose, that Mark had hurt her precious child, came rushing over. And as he lay on the ground, she bit into his neck. And the other two females, to support their friend, raced over. One bit his wrist, and one bit his leg. And he's lying there thinking, how will I ever get away? And as he looks up, charging across the island with his hair bristling and his limps, lips in a bunch in a furious skull is old man and he, thought, he thinks I've hurt his precious infant and he prepared to die. But what happened? Old man physically pulled those three females away one by one and managed to keep them roused and screaming as they were, keep them away while Mark dragged himself to safety. And I visited Mark when he came out of hospital. And he said, Jane, there's no question. Old man saved my life. So to me, this is a really symbolic story. Because if a chimpanzee who's been so badly harmed by people can reach out to help a human friend in time of need, then how much more so should we reach out to help the animals in their time of need? And that's what all of you are doing. So I'm very glad to have had the opportunity to share a few slightly disjointed thoughts with you, but they come from my heart. They come from years of visiting zoos, meeting keepers, and talking to students and young people who have been inspired and set on a different trail through life as a result of visiting a zoo. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Doug.